Tonight, we are going to talk about repentance. Tonight is about repentance. I will be focusing on Psalms chapter 51, verses 1 through 9. Um, repentance is something that needs to be Discuss repentance should be a lifestyle. It should be something we do daily. It is important that we repent, that we turn away from our wicked ways. You know, many people love to love to quote uh, Second Chronicles, and everybody loves to say, you know, if my people who are humble, uh, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, but we leave out the part where it says and turn away from their wicked ways. Turn away from their wicked ways. And when you repent, you are humbling yourself. When you come to God, you are saying, Lord, I repent of my sins. I repent of my idolatry. I repent of my sexual morality. I repent of my rebelliousness. Lord, I repent. It is important that we live a lifestyle of repentance. So tonight I wanted to teach on repentance and I thought there was no better chapter then Psalms chapter 51. Now we won't get through all of it tonight. We're going to finish the rest of it in the morning, but tonight we're going to focus on verses one through nine. So starting at verse one, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So when you are reading Psalms 51, for those of you that are following along, this is the prayer of repentance that David prayed unto God, that David cried out unto God after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Just for a little backstory, remember David saw Bathsheba across the way, whether she was bathing, whatever she was doing. He saw her across the way. He thought she was very attractive. He uh, he, he had slept with her he impregnated her and he tried to hide it by having Uriah come home from war, having Uriah sleep with Bathsheba, then having trying to get Uriah drunk so that he could stay home with his wife so that basically Uriah would never think anything twice about it. But Uriah refused to do all of that. So David put Uriah on the front lines and um, basically had Uriah killed. So that's why you read in the Bible how, hey, although David had someone murdered, um, he was still a man after God's own heart because he repented. He repented of his sins. He knew that he did wrong. So this is the prayer that David prayed after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and after the prophet Nathan had addressed him and reminded him, God saw what you did. God revealed to me, and it's not my business to tell everybody else, but God saw what you did behind closed doors. So, so let's continue on here with verse number one. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Have mercy on me, O God. What does that word mercy mean? Lord, be gracious to me. Show me favor. Show me pity. Have pity on me, O Lord. Be gracious unto me. We need the grace of God. See, some people walk around and they think that, oh, God didn't see me lying there. God didn't see me cheating there. God didn't see me in my manipulation. No, you have to understand that God shows mercy. When we are in the midst of sin, when we are in the midst of knowingly doing wrong, God is showing his mercy through his grace. God is showing his mercy. You know, there are a lot of people today who have favor where God can easily go, no, I'm not going to give you any favor. You're not going to have favor anywhere, but because the Lord is merciful, we need to repent. We need to repent. It is important that we repent because we must always recognize, as David recognized here, God is a merciful God. We serve a merciful God, but some people don't recognize his mercy. Some people who do recognize his mercy actually abuse it. I'm not talking about saying you repent. You say, Lord, forgive me here, but then you turn around and you're doing the same thing. No, repentance is a complete 180. You turn away from the drugs. You turn away from the fornication. You turn away from the drunkenness. You turn away from the lying. You turn away from the cheating. You turn away from every wicked thing. Have mercy upon me, oh God. How many of us need mercy today? I know I love it when God shows me mercy. I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner just like every single one of you, which is why I repent. 
I make it a lifestyle. It's a habit. I do not go one day without repenting. I do not go one day without asking the Lord to forgive me of anything that I might have said, anything that I might have thought, anything that I might have done that I am not, that I may or may not be aware of. Lord, forgive me. I turn away from my wicked ways. I turn away from things that are not pleasing unto you. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. What does that word loving kindness mean? According, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your goodness, according to your kindness, according to your faithfulness. How many of us know that we serve a faithful God? We serve a kind God. We serve a good God. We all know that only the Father is good. I'm not good. You're not good. Your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, there's no man that's good. Only God is good, which is why we need to go to God and say, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have faith favor on us. Lord, show us your grace. Lord, have pity on us. Oh, Lord, show us mercy according to your loving kindness, according to your goodness, according to your faithfulness. If God wasn't faithful, he wouldn't have mercy on you. If God wasn't faithful, he wouldn't give you time to repent. If God wasn't faithful, he wouldn't make sure that your mama's going to come around, that your daddy's going to come around, that your brother, your sister, your best friend, he wouldn't be so patient. He wouldn't be so graceful. But because of his mercy, we have the opportunity to repent according to his loving kindness, according to the multitude of his tender mercies. Mercies, mercies. He is merciful in each and every area of our lives, but this does not mean that you continue to do what you know is not pleasing unto God. You say, I'm sorry, but you keep doing it. I've been there before. I ain't, I'm being just totally transparent with y'all. I know the lifestyle of, you know, going to the club on a Saturday night and then going to church Sunday morning or going to church, went, going to uh, a Wednesday night Bible study, but then right afterwards, going to the bars, going bar hopping and everything. That is not pleasing unto God. But I thank God because according to his loving kindness and because he had mercy on me, I'm here today. Praying, teaching, calling others unto repentance because I saw the mercy he had on me. I have, I, I, I know people who have died in the midst of hitting runs. I know people who have been behind the wheel driving drunk getting into car accidents, ended up in the hospital. There are people today who are in the midst of liver failure, but because of the Lord's mercy, he kept me. And now that I know that he kept me, and now that I'm aware of his, of the multitude of his tender mercies, not his mercy isn't singular, it's plural. The multitude of his tender mercies. Some of you know the mercy of God when you were a drug addict. Some of you know what it's like. Cameron, I used to be strung up high on crack and cocaine. I used to sit in the house and be high on weed all day. I know what it's like to feel depressed. I know what it's like just to sit on the couch and just feel like nothing. There's nothing to do. All I want to do is be high. All I want to do is get high. All I want to do is sit in, and sit in the slums and do nothing. But because of the Lord's mercies, you are here today. You are praying today. You are tuning in today. Some of you, God has shown you mercy. You slept with every other man. You slept with every other woman. Some of you should have three, four, five, or six baby daddies. Some of you should have three, four, five, six baby mamas. But because of the Lord's mercy, he kept you from STDs. He kept you from a lifestyle of illness. He kept his hand on you because of the multitude of his mercies. But in our pride, we don't, we don't repent. There are many today in their pride, they don't repent. They say, I don't need to repent. I don't need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. I don't need to turn away. That's why he went to the cross. Uh-uh. Don't manipulate the word. 
he didn't go to the cross. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. My son came in here. <laughs> he didn't go to the cross. He didn't go to the cross for you to continue to, to just sin over and over and over and over again. I'm so sorry, y'all. Forgive me. I thought the door was shut. <laughs> He didn't go to the cross over and over and over and over. He didn't go to the cross for you to continue to sin over and over and over again. He didn't go to the cross so that you can continue to get drunk. He didn't go to the cross so that you can continue to get high. He didn't go to the cross so you can sleep with whoever you want. He didn't go to the cross so you can lie. He didn't go to the cross for you to do foolish things. No, he went to the cross so that you may inherit everlasting life. God had so much mercy on his people, on his children, on his sons and his daughters that he literally gave his one and only begotten son. How much more mercy, how much more mercy can a loving God show? According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. What are, what are transgressions? My rebellions. How many of us have been rebellious? How many of us have said, oh, it's my way or the highway? How many of us said, Lord, I trust, you know, Lord, I trust you, but I don't like your will for my life. It's my will over your will. It's my way over your way. Lord, I want to do things my way, not your way. I want to go where I want to go. I don't want to go where you called me to go. I want to say what I want to say. I don't want to be silent. I want to be, I want to boast. I don't want to be humble. I don't want to be meek. I don't want to be quiet. I don't want to let you fight my battles according to the multitude of his tender mercies he has blotted out your rebelliousness because all of us here today at some point in time have been rebellious verse two wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin wash me thoroughly from my iniquity what does that word iniquity mean? Wash me thoroughly from my perversity. Wash me thoroughly from my depravity. How many people today have ever said perverse words? And I'm not just talking about sexual things. How many of you today have cursed? I know there's some of you tuning in today. There's some of you watching this. You've probably said every word in the book. You've probably cursed out so many people left and right. You don't even know how many words you've let loose. But the Lord has washed you thoroughly from your iniquity. His detail, when he details you, it's greater than the detail that any car can get. His, his washing is more thorough than any, than any car wash. His washing is more thorough than any bleach, than any washing machine, than any laundry detergent. His washing of your iniquities is thorough. And the Lord has cleansed you from your sin. The, the psalmist here said, and cleanse me from my sin. And cleanse me from my sin. We need to be praying, Lord, cleanse me from my sin. Lord, deliver me. Lord, I repent. Some of you just right now, some of you today, tonight, you need to just repent. You need to call it out. You need to expose it unto God. We say, Lord, forgive us of our sins. And doesn't mean that you'll be able to list every single sin. No, because like I said, my prayer sometimes is, Lord, forgive me of the sins that I both knowingly and unknowingly committed. And usually the ones that I know I committed, I call it out. I go in and say, Lord, forgive me of this. Forgive me of that. Forgive me for lying. Forgive me, oh Lord. Forgive me for, for cheating here. Forgive me for doing this. Forgive me for doing that. Forgive me, oh Lord, for making up stories. Forgive me, oh Lord. Forgive me. Whatever it is, Lord, forgive me. But also forgive me of the things that I don't know. We need to pray, Lord, cleanse us of our sins. Some people today, too many people, and really it's 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 a lot in the body of Christ. They, they say, oh, I'm a good person. I don't need to repent. Oh, I'm a good person. I've been saved for 20 years. I've been saved for 30 years. Oh, I don't need to repent. Yes, you do. You don't know when your last day is. Why would you want to go any day without repenting? Why would you want to go any time without asking the Lord to forgive you? Why won't you humble yourself and pray and turn away from your wicked ways and seek him? Why won't you? 
you don't have a repentant heart. Verse two said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse three, for I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge the perversity. I acknowledge the rebelliousness. I acknowledge the depravity. I acknowledge it, O oh Lord. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Some of you today, you need to acknowledge your sin. You need to acknowledge that you've fallen short. I acknowledge that I've fallen short. I acknowledge that I'm not perfect. I acknowledge that I've messed up. I acknowledge that I've done things that I shouldn't have done. I've looked at things that I shouldn't have looked at. I've said things that I should have never said. I acknowledge that, but maybe you need to do the same thing. Some of you feel heavy. Some of you feel you don't have that joy. You don't have that peace. You don't feel free. It's because you're holding in. It's because you have pride. It's because you won't repent of your sins. You need to acknowledge your transgressions. David said, my sin is always before me. Verse number four, against you, you only have I sinned. And done this evil in your sight against you, O oh Lord. You only have I sinned. You know what's funny when we when 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 that day comes when we die, all of us, Hebrew says all of us, so we have a day in which we're appointed to die. All of us have a day in which we're appointed to die. When that day comes, it won't be your daddy judging you, it won't be your mother judging you. It won't be your brother, your sister. It won't be them judging. You know who's going to be judging you? God. He sits on the throne. It is him whom you have sinned against, which is why David said here, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. What evil have you done in the sight of God? I get it. You may have been behind closed doors. The door may have been locked when you stepped out on your spouse. The door may have been shut when you were getting high on the couch with cracker cocaine or marijuana. Yeah, the door may have been shut when you were looking at pornography. The door may have been shut when you were lying. People probably didn't know that you weren't even telling the truth. People probably didn't know that you were gambling. People probably didn't know that you were in idolatry. People probably didn't know that you were in fornication. The door may have been shut and those things may have very well been kept private, but the Lord... He sees everything, which is why we need to repent. We must live a lifestyle of repentance. We must have a repentant heart. It all comes back to the heart. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. The Lord's judgment is just. He's blameless. He's a fair judge. He knows each and everything you've done, each and everything you've said. He knows what's in your heart. Man may not know what's in your heart. Man may not know your motive. Man may not know what you dwell on each and every day, but the Lord, he knows your heart, which is why we must be repenting each and every day. Verse number five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. We were born in this life of sin. It is not one child. It is not one adult who lives this life without sinning. Some point in time, you fell short. Some point in time, you disobeyed your parents. Some point in time, you lied. Some point in time, you didn't clean your room. You didn't wash the dishes. You didn't fold the clothes. Some point in time, you didn't do what your husband or your wife asked you to do. You didn't love them. You didn't forgive them. You didn't render the affection that was due unto them. At some point in time, we fell short at the glory of God. We need to understand that we are sinners. Yes, Jesus loves us. Yes, he forgives us. Yes, he went to the cross. But y'all, I want you to take a deeper look at your heart. You know what's in your heart. Even as I give this word today, as I deliver this word, I don't know what's in your heart. <laughs> I don't know what your motive is for praying today. I don't know what your motive is for tuning in on Facebook Live today. 
I don't know what your motive is for tuning in on YouTube. I don't know what your motive is. I don't know why you're here. I don't know why you're tuning in, but the Lord knows your heart. He knows your heart. Cameron Bracey doesn't. In sin, my mother conceived me. That's how you know we're all imperfect. Verse number six, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. It's in those hidden areas that many people don't like to address. They say, you know what? <laughs> I never address this. I never acknowledge this. But while I know this person offended me, I'm not going to forgive them. But nobody else will know that. You know, I know my daddy stepped out on me and he abandoned my family. He abandoned my brothers and my sisters and I, and we were left without a father and my mother struggled raising us. And she tried to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, put food on the table, did all of that. But we went through some hard times. We struggled and I'm bitter towards my father, but nobody will ever know that. Right here, the word says, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. But you, but the Lord can't make you to know wisdom in those hidden areas if you don't repent, if you don't acknowledge that you, that if you don't acknowledge your transgressions, if you don't acknowledge your wrongdoings, if you don't acknowledge that you have done wrong, that you have been, been wrong, it's hard for people to say, I was wrong. My wife. Maybe when we first got married, I wasn't the best at it, but I'll say humbly today, I believe I've gotten better and only my wife can speak to this, but I will go to her and say, you know, babe, I was wrong. I was wrong in what I said. I was wrong in the way I behaved. I was wrong in the way that I spoke to you. I was wrong in my judgment of this matter. I, I, I thought that was the price for the groceries, but I was wrong. I thought that this wasn't on sale and I got the other product, but I didn't get what you told me to get. I, I, I was wrong. I was wrong. It's okay to say that you are wrong. Some of you need to probably say it right now. I was wrong. Lord, I was wrong. I was wrong for cheating on you, oh God. I was wrong for not for, for not ministering to my brothers and sisters. I was wrong for not forgiving. I was wrong for being rebellious. I was wrong for not loving. I was wrong. Say I was wrong. Let the Lord know that you acknowledge your wrong. It's okay. The Lord can only make you know wisdom in those hidden parts when you open up to him, when you acknowledge it, when you reveal it. He knows it's there, but will you acknowledge it? Will you repent? Verse number seven, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, I thank Jesus. I thank Jesus that he went to the cross and he shed his blood on that ark. And he said, you know what? I've washed away all their sins. I've blotted out all their transgressions. I am the living sacrifice. I thank the Lord that he has made us white as snow. So that someday when you and I die, when it's our time to go before the Father, we can have on those white gowns, those gowns that are whiter than snow. Verse number eight, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice and hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. This was a repentant prayer, y'all. David was repenting for his shortcoming. David was repenting for committing adultery. And a lot of people say, well, not only did he step out with Bathsheba, not only did he cheat there, but y'all, he also cheated on God. Anytime you sin, you can might as well look at it and say, you know what? I was rebellious and I cheated on God. Lord. I repent. I repent for not having patience with my child. I repent not having patience with my wife or with my husband. I repent for not being loving. I repent for not being kind. I repent for not forgiving. I repent for my bitterness. I repent of it all, Lord. Lord, I repent. 
Repentance is something that is so uncomfortable for many to teach, for many to talk about, for many to do, because repentance causes you to look inwardly. Repentance causes you to look on the inside of yourself. You stop looking at what the pastor has done wrong. You stop looking at what the minister has done wrong. You stop looking at what your mama and your daddy did wrong. You stop looking at how, what your friend did wrong. You stop looking at how your supervisor was wrong. When you repent, you say, I'm wrong. I'm the one that's fallen short. I'm the one that's messed up. Lord, search me. Think about Psalms. One, I think it's chapter 139 when he said, Lord, search me and know my heart. Search me and know my heart. When's the last time you asked God to search you? There's an amber alert that should be calling out from your heart. There's some things that have been missing. There's some things that have gone lost in your heart and you need to cry out. You need to repent unto God and say, Lord, search me and know my heart. Test me. We're in a time when many college students, we're in that season, many college students, they're taking their finals, they're taking their all these exams, preparing for the next semester. They're, 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 they're trying to see, have they really learned this semester? Have they really learned what they've been taught? Are they ready for the next semester? Are they ready for the next class? Are they ready for part two or part three? Are they ready for the advanced material? Well, when you say, Lord, test me and know my anxieties, Test me and know my anxious thoughts, Lord. Test me. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me. Notice repentance points to you. When you are repenting, you're saying, Lord, I need you to check me. Lord, I need you to correct me. Point out anything in me. That offends you. Not anything that offends my daddy. Not anything that offends my mama. Not anything that offends my pastor or my loved ones or my friends or my siblings. Lord, point out anything in me that offends you. And then lead me along the path of everlasting life. So many people today, they want to go into that path of everlasting life, but they don't want to, they don't want God to search their hearts. They don't want God to test them. They don't want God to point out anything in them. Repentance points to me. We all know that saying, when you point one finger at somebody else, you got three fingers pointed right back at you. Guess what? I put my hand on my heart and I say, Lord, check me. Why am I uneasy? Why am I at dis-ease? Lord, what is it in me that is not pleasing unto you? I don't care how many sermons I deliver. I don't care about titles. I don't care about praises. I don't care about any of that. Because at the end of the day, none of that matters. You know what I care about? That my heart is in the right posture. You know what I care about? That your heart is in the right posture. The Lord needs to search our hearts. We need to ask God to search our hearts. I want to take you all to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He called the people to repent. It was more than an altar call. It was more than hugging an elder. It was more than raising your hands on high and saying, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. He told them to repent. Nothing wrong with coming to the altar. Clearly, it's nothing wrong with accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Lord wants your heart. I imagine how many people respond to an altar call, but they never repent. They never truly ask God to, to search their heart, to do surgery in their heart, to do a spiritual, to do a correction in their heart. Yeah, Lord, I accept I accept you as my Lord and Savior, but I'm still not going to forgive. He says your heart is not in the right place. How can you receive me, but you won't let me work in you? How can you say you accept me as your Lord and Savior? You want me to save you, but you won't even allow me to cut you open here. 
You won't even allow me to expose this so that you can repent of it. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, repent, repent. Luke chapter five, verses 31 through 32. Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Like I said, each and every one of us are sinners. Each and every one of us have fallen short, probably will fall short at some point in time, sooner or later. Jesus call is calling us to repentance. He's not calling you to cash another check. He's not calling you to a million dollars. He's not calling you to win the lottery. And I'm not speaking evil against any of the scenes, but all I'm saying is he's not calling you to any of that. He's calling us to repent. When's the last time you've truly repented? We pray, we submit prayer requests, we call on God, we lift up his name. But when is the last time you've said, Lord, check me? We make sure that we attend every every uh, checkup with our doctor. We make sure, you know, you make sure you go get your mammograms. You make sure you go get your prostate check. You make sure you go get your teeth cleansed. You make sure you get all this work done on your body. But when is the last time you've asked God, Lord, search my heart? <laughs> A lot of people don't want the Lord to search their heart because he's going to reveal some things that may very well offend them. That may very well make them feel uncomfortable. That may put them at dis-ease. And then they'll be troubled. And then they'll say, well, no, there's nothing wrong with that, Lord. I, I'm sorry, Lord. I disagree. I don't believe there's anything wrong with that. I don't believe that's idolatry. I don't believe that I got to wait until I'm married to, to, to have sex. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm faithful. I've been faithful to this one woman just because she's not my wife. I mean, we're acting like it. No, Lord. But see, see, see that's what happens. I think about a doctor when, 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 or a cardiologist, a cardio, a cardiothoracic surgeon, when they take the scalpel and they cut open one's chest and they look at the heart. <laughs> you may say my heart feels well; it's beating, it's pumping blood. I feel good, but they may say, "Yeah, but you got some blockage here. You got an artery that's clogged here. You got a vein that's messed up there, and we got to do some cleaning." No, 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 no. I disagree. I feel fine. And then years, 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 years down the road, when something happens. You want to call on God or God goes, but I, I had them search your heart for a reason. To expose that something was wrong. Tonight. God, I believe, has placed me here to remind some of you, you need to repent. He needs to check your heart. You need to schedule an appointment with God and just take a seat somewhere in silence. Say, Lord, search me. Search me. Point out anything, anything in me that offends you. And y'all may very well have some things in your house that may offend God. But you won't get rid of it. Because it doesn't offend you. You won't get rid of it. Because the culture approves of it. You won't get rid of it. <laughs> because you say, I believe, I don't see anything wrong with it. But see, when the Lord points it out. When the Lord says, this offends me, shouldn't that put you on edge? Like, oh, I don't want anything in me. I don't want anything near me that offends God. Last scripture I want to share with you all, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. It's But sometimes people think they can go to salvation. They never have to repent. But then they wonder why they regret what they've done for the rest of their lives. They wonder why they have a hard time letting go. They wonder why they're still battling with certain things in their hearts. They got a smile on their face, but pain in their heart. 
because they didn't have godly sorrow. Paul said godly sorrow produces repentance. If you are sorrowful before God, you will repent. And when you repent, it leads to salvation. So y'all say it with me one more time this morning. I'm actually go to the scripture. I'm going to read it for you all. Just so you know where it's at exactly. I know it's in Psalm, I think, 139. I think it is. Yep, Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. A lot of people today are battling anxiety. A lot of people today are taking anxiety medication, taking Adderall. They're taking all of these things to calm them down. They won't allow the Lord to try them. They won't allow the Lord to put their heart on the stand. They won't open up to God. They won't allow him to search their heart. The Lord is calling you to repent. The Lord is calling his people to repent. I'm not talking about a little petty prayer of forgiveness. I'm talking about a, a, a heart shift. A, a mind shift, a shift where, you know what, Lord, I'm done with this. You said it's wrong. Your word makes it clear it's wrong. You've made it clear that it offends you. You made it clear that it's offensive to you. I'm done with it. I repent. I'm completely done with it. Repent. I say, I'm, I'm going to say it a couple more times today. Repent, repent, and repent. For as John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is.